Lord Hamilton of Epsom, member of the British Conservative Party and of the House of Lords since 2005, is chairman of the European Atlantic Group, a non-aligned, all-party, registered charity aiming at strengthening transatlantic links. He is also a trustee of the National Army Museum. In the past, he served as chairman of the powerful 1922 Committee and as Minister of State and Parliamentary Under Secretary for the Ministry of Defence. He was Lord Commissioner and Assistant Whip for His Majesty's Treasury and Conservative MP for Epsom and Ewell. Additionally, he once served as Parliamentary Private Secretary to former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and as a member of various influential committees, including currently serving on the Joint Committee for the National Security Strategy and on the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Welcome back to ANN Satellite Television, to the English Hour. Thank you so much for joining us. It's good to have you with us. Our guest today is Lord Hamilton, Archie Hamilton. Thank you so much, sir, for being our guest. It's great. Great, to have you. great pleasure to be here. Well, bless you. We, we've got three subjects for discussion. We're going to talk about Britain and Europe. We're going to talk about the whole issue of migration and the issue of extremism, very critical issues these days. Yes, certainly are. Bless you. The European Union, a political and economic union of 28 member states, operates through a system of supranational institutions. EU policies aim to ensure the free movement of people, goods, services and capital between member states. 19 member states are also part of a monetary union with the euro as their currency. Britain will hold a referendum by 2017 on whether or not to exit the European Union. According to the latest opinion polls, 40% of the British public want to leave the European Union to free Britain from the suffocating hold of European Union red tape and political interference and free up the country's businesses to trade more successfully with the rest of the world. However, 38% want to stay. David Cameron has said he will campaign for Britain to remain in the European Union if he gets the reforms he wants. If Eurosceptics prevail and Britain leaves, will the European Union structure have to be revised? What would become of Britain's trading relationship with the 27 other countries? Will Scotland fight for greater independence as a consequence? So, Britain and Europe, Lord Hamilton. I mean, where are we? Where are we going? We have this referendum. The British people will vote whether they stay or whether they leave. You will have a, a role of sorts in this because you're very much part of the campaign to leave Europe. I mean, tell me, do uh, you think you're going to win? Do you think Britain is going to leave the European Union and stand alone again? I think we may well win. I think it's, um, it's going to be very close. I don't think anybody can say mm -hmm. with confidence that one side or the other is going to win. Um, but what we do know is this referendum's got to take place by October next year. Really, October, it's the mm. end of, uh, sorry, the year after. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. So October, October 2017. Yeah. 2017. Yeah. It effectively, it means October, I think, is the latest date you could possibly hold a referendum. Mm. Um, and whether we have it next June in 2016 or whether it goes on is anybody's guess. Mm. It is, of course, in the Prime Minister's gift as to when he holds this. And I suspect he'd be looking hard at the opinion polls before he makes the decision. But does he really care? Does it really matter to him? Is he really a 
pro-European or does it just a headache that he wants to get out of his hair and move on before the next elections? It's certainly a headache he wants to get out of his hair, but of course he doesn't want to lose because I think that would imperil his own position as Prime Minister. But he... But does it matter? I mean, he will resign. He has already told us that before the next election, I mean, there will be a new leader of the Tory party, uh, obviously only shortly before the next election, but uh, nonetheless, it doesn't really matter to his own... I suppose it's part of a matter of heritage or something, a matter of uh, his uh, personal feeling of, of his destiny. Maybe he wants to leave on a high, but... but you feel it's important to him? I think it's very important to him because I think um, he will be looking now to think what his legacy is going to be. Mm. Um, and if he'd lost the referendum, um, I think that would be not good for him. Um, and also then um, we are talking, I think, about him. There would be great pressure on him to resign. I certainly wouldn't encourage him to resign mm. if he'd mm. lost the referendum because I think um, he's been very brave to hold it in the beginning. And I think the Europeans have made it very difficult for him to actually get any concessions, and that's one of his problems that he's facing as we speak. Um, so I, I think he wouldn't want to go uh, two years earlier, mm. say. Mm. Um, I think he's probably rather liking the job now that he's got a Conservative majority. <laughs> yes, um, yes. And would probably like to do another two yes, years before yes. he does stand down. I mean, he has been... Things have gone well to this point for the Conservative Party in government. Uh, you have to... Uh, yes, I mean, it's remarkable that... that first a coalition and now, now as you say, a majority. Um, and this is a defining issue because, the, in a sense, the threat to the Conservative future as the lead party in Britain is partly from the UK Independence Party, which is, is coming, from the, coming from the right, really. Well, it's a sort of populist party, but we must bear in mind that it's making serious inroads into the Labour Party as well. And mm. They're mm. as worried about it, I think, as the Conservatives are. But your, yours is not certainly, well, most certainly not, as being a long, long-standing member of the Tory establishment. Yours is not a, a kind of a UKIP position, but you have very personal reasons for feeling Britain should leave Europe. Yes, I think UKIP concentrates very much on the immigration issue, which is very important and is going to play a very big role when the referendum mm. comes along. But my concerns are much more to do with the economy and really whether Europe is working, which I don't think it is. I don't think that the Eurozone is functioning at all efficiently, um, and the economy generally is moving very slowly. And let's face it, when people like me voted mm. to stay in the EU in 1975, um, we were doing that from the position that the United Kingdom was a poor, rather run-down country, yes. and we were hoping to benefit from joining this rich club. The interesting thing is now those roles were reversed. But I mean, it's just because we're having a good time. Does, shouldn't we equally care for, some, I mean, if we, we got the benefits in the early days, shouldn't we be... I don't think we did get the benefits. I think mm -hmm. um, uh, you could argue that actually we've suffered from an awful lot of rather bad legislation from Europe over mm -hmm. the years. And I would argue that they have a business model that really doesn't work very well at all. Um, and um, when we talk about reform in Europe, what we've actually got to do is to see reform um, in individual countries rather than particularly with the relationship between the United Kingdom and the EU. So, ultimately, you, I mean, is it, despite the, the pragmatic argument, is there an idealistic argument? I mean, is, surely it's better to be in one world, to be a world without frontiers. People can move freely about Europe, and it is, it is a much better world that, now that Europe is united and not fragmented as before. Well, I would cast doubt as to how united Europe is today. Mm. Um, it's certainly coming under enormous strain on the whole business of the free movement of people. Yeah. The Schengen Agreement, which, as you know, created this, uh, um, put the many of the European countries within one border, so you can travel freely from one country to another, that's now looking not quite so clever as it was originally. But really, this is a much more fundamental argument, I think, that the people who designed Europe in the beginning wanted to turn uh, the EU, wanted to turn all the peoples of Europe into one people, mm. rather like the United States. They wanted to create a federal Europe. Yes. Um, and I think that was always um, a, an absurd concept. We're not Americans. Um, we've never signed up to the idea of a strong president elected with a strong central government and a lot of taxes being collected centrally 
mm. and then distributed from there, as happens in the United States. Um, and so this has never really worked. The Germans always really thought they were joining a monetary union, and the people who were looking for a federal Europe wanted a fiscal union. And of course, they're two very different things. Mm. But wouldn't you, I mean, in principle, isn't it a, the idea of a kind of melting pot Europe, United States of Europe? Why is that intrinsically wrong? Uh, many of the young people in Britain would quite like that, surely, a, a more... Well, we, we, we do want to, to have good trading relationships with Europe. We want to travel there and so forth. But we don't want political union. Um, and I don't think the European people want political union either. So although there's this great ambition to create a political union, um, I just don't think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you don't create a political union for the Eurozone, the Eurozone will fail. It mm -hmm. has got to have fiscal transfers. Money has got to be transferred from the centre to the poorer parts of the Eurozone. And the Germans are not prepared to countenance that. So probably, unless they do get political union within the Eurozone, it'll fail anyway. And if, if Europe had a more democratic makeup in the sense that the European Parliament was truly empowered and had teeth and and it was not so much a well a bureaucratic union and was actually a real political union um, would it make you more comfortable or no I don't think that's ever going to happen though because the individual governments within the um, well the Eurozone particularly um, they regard the Council of Ministers as being a very important part of the decision-making process, and they wouldn't want to lose that to, to a European mm -hmm. Parliament. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't see the European Parliament f filling this role of being the sort of the federal organisation for Europe. Um, we've got to have a central elected government, and we're miles away from that, and I personally don't think it's ever going to happen. And you'd go back to the pre-European Union? I mean, it was... Arguably, Ted Heath uh, the, took us into the European Union. It's, it uh, you could say it was a, well, I don't know whether it's fair to say, but you could say it was a Conservative Party project. It um, was. So having, having done that, you won't now want to turn the clock back to, um, to a situation in which we go back to the old trading ties with the Commonwealth and so no, on? No, no, no. We, we've got to have very important trading ties with Europe. We've got to have a free trade agreement with Europe. And there's no reason why we shouldn't. South Korea has a free trade agreement with Europe, as mm -hmm. does Canada. So mm -hmm. I don't quite see why we shouldn't have a free trade agreement right. with Europe. They sell um, half as much more to us than we do to them. So it's very much in their interests that we should have a free mm. trade agreement. Yes. Um, trade was what I signed up for when I voted to stay in the EU in 1975. Um, but of course, when we've gone way beyond a free trade agreement. Um, we're now um, in, a, in a political union, um, which means that a lot of the laws that we live under are made in Europe, and I don't think that's satisfactory to most people in this country. And then the, I mean, I suppose you could say, yes, uh, the, the, the laws are a problem. Um, the, 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 the European regulations on things like vacuum cleaners that <laughs> impact the British housewife sometimes seem quite bizarre. But um, yes, uh, for our Middle East listeners, uh, they, they have a cap on the power of a, a Hoover, uh, mm. you know, and so on. So some of the laws, are, uh, maybe it's environmentally sound to have a cap on the power of a Hoover, but it can seem quite bizarre being having these rules thrust upon you by effectively a European bureaucracy that seems unelected. Um, and that well, it is unelected. The European Commission, of course, is not elected at all mm. and has the power to initiate legislation. And mm. much of the legislation comes from the European Commission. And that is one of the problems. And this is a problem that the, the European Union is facing across the whole of Europe, that mm. people resent the fact that it is an undemocratic organisation and has this power to tell other governments what to do. Um, and this is felt particularly strongly in this country. But uh, Euroscepticism is not a unique British invention. No, it's no. Uh, something that's been felt quite strongly across the whole of Europe. Um, recently, we've seen elections in Spain um, where Podemos d did extremely well. Um, and they are, of course, an anti-austerity party who are basically scooping up votes in Spain because unemployment in Spain is still over 20%. Mm. And, uh, and youth unemployment is double that. So not surprisingly, people don't feel that they're better off in the European Union or indeed in the Eurozone in places like Spain, Italy, 
um, uh, and of course Greece, where we've seen tremendous outbursts, recent changes in the government in Portugal. Um, there's a lot of movement going on, which is basically resenting this very, very heavy-handed approach that we get from the centre of the European Union. And uh, I think I if we do vote to leave, I'm not saying we will, but I I'm, I'm sincerely hope that we do, um, it'll be up to the British people to decide, but if we do vote to leave, I think we'll find a lot of other countries having referenda and uh, wanting to uh, possibly explore going down the same road. Wow. So frightening for Europe. What about for us? I mean, are there unforeseen consequences? Scotland, for instance, has, has said that it wishes to stay in if... Well, how can that function? If, uh, if the, if well, it can't. It can't? No. I it mean, Scotland voted to stay within the um, Union of the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom is the member of, of the European Union. And if the United Kingdom votes to come out, then Scotland comes out with us. Scotland then may say, well, we need another referendum on whether Scotland no stays within the United <laughs> yes. Kingdom. But they've only just had one, and yeah. it'll be up to the British Parliament as to whether we give them another one. Interesting, interesting. So you don't see a Scottish problem? You think that's going to be OK? I think the Scottish problem has been exaggerated, and I think it's an opportunity for the very left-wing government of the Scottish nationalists mm -hmm. to make a tremendous fuss about all this. But um, at the end of the day, the Scots voted to stay in the Union of the United Kingdom. And if the United Kingdom votes to come out, the Scots will come out with us. <laughs> and if they then um, subsequently get another referendum on independence, um, which depends on the British Parliament as to whether they would be given that, then they can then apply, if they want to, to go back into the EU. That would take some time because the countries in the European Union are not very happy with bits of their countries breaking off. Oh, exactly. The Spanish have a very yes, big problem with exactly. the Catalans. Um, you know, everybody has separate bits mm. in their countries, um, and they don't want to see them encouraged. So I think they would make the Scots wait for quite a long time before they admitted them back into the EU, if they ever did. Interesting. But then given, nonetheless, uh, we're seeing an, a kind of fragmentation of countries throughout the, across the world. Um, we've some of our viewers are Syrian. Quite a substantial proportion of our viewers will be Syrian. I mean, um, they are seeing their own country de facto partitioned, and, and it's rather sad what's going on. Similarly in Iraq, I mean, Iraq is split into three parts now. The job of putting it back together is almost Herculean. Uh, it's a huge task. Um, and we're seeing nationalism. We've seen nationalism in the Balkans. We've seen the fragmentation of former Yugoslavia. It's a feature of life, even in the Middle East, North Sudan, South Sudan are split away. In a sense, is this merely part of the same trend, this, this uh, little, this, this parochial approach that we're, we're moving away from? Well, I think if the price that you pay for peace in the former <coughs> Republic of Yugoslavia is that the, basically <coughs> the balkanization yes. of communities there, then it's probably a worthwhile price to pay. Um, and I think the tr same may be true of Syria. A lot of people are now talking about Syria mm. um, being broken up into component parts. Mm. Um, but if that, the result of that is the Syrians live in peace, I think um, they would probably buy that rather than go for a united country that was constantly um, enduring civil war, which has caused them such appalling damage. True. Well, they'd buy it, but they, they wouldn't. Oddly enough, I don't think most of them would want it. They would buy it as a, as a poor second alternative or, or whatever. Um, it's quite interesting. I mean, the Dayton agreement over uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina yes. actually said that all the people living there should live together. Th they didn't. They separated and mm. went their separate ways. And you now have the communities living separate from each other. But they are living in peace. So you would celebrate this. Um, I mean, it's a, what you're espousing is a kind of nationalism. Really, isn't it? I mean, uh, well, I, I think people have got to live, uh, they've got to be comfortable in their own skins as to how they live. Mm. And I think, with all the advantage of hindsight, um, I think joining a political union of the European Union um, was a very great mistake. Um, when I voted to stay in the EU, um, I did that on the basis that this was a free trade area. And I'm very keen on people trading with each other. I think that the North Atlantic free trade area is an overwhelming success, but it doesn't demand political 
um, adherence to certain rules that the EU does, and uh, mm. this is the difference. It all started, of course, let's face it, after the Second World War, when um, mm. uh, Monet and, and others said that you should try and turn all the Europeans, uh, all the countries, citizens of Europe, into Europeans. And so then they wouldn't go to war with each other. Well, it's and worked this, in a way. Well, it hasn't worked at all because what you're <laughs> now seeing um, is, is nationalist parties growing up yes. because prosperity is now um, not being found in Europe. Mm. There's massive high un levels of unemployment. Um, the growth rates are uh, pretty small. We're talking about one, one and a half mm. percent growth compared with two and a half percent in the United Kingdom. Um, and these nationalist parties are now growing up. Um, and if we have tremendous problems with immigration, um, then of course this, these nationalist parties will get even stronger. Um, and you will actually have achieved completely the opposite of what people set out to do when they set up the European Union in the beginning. Well, um, migration is our next topic for conversation. Before we move on to that, however, we ought to ask the $64,000 question, as they say in America, in terms of, at least in regard, maybe not for Britons, but with regard to many of our viewers in the Middle East who will care about foreign policy. Um, we're going to, if your hope is realized, we are going to leave the European Union. Um, we're going to, many would say, relinquish much of our clout internationally in terms of uh, being a heavyweight player. At the moment, we're in a bigger club where, where we can drive some of the agenda, where we do drive some of the agenda. Um, Aren't we, and, and I think Britain and Europe, Britain in Europe, we have a seminal role to play perhaps in the world, perhaps we don't play it strongly enough, but, but we have obviously been very important in international affairs as a nation. Um, how, Britain leaving Europe, how is this going to change the, the game? Well, I don't think that European foreign policy has taken us very far, to be quite honest. And one mm -hmm. of the reasons is it's tremendously difficult to get agreement among 28 different nations with different attitudes to foreign mm -hmm. policy um, to actually agree on anything. So, um, I, I d you know, the, the EU has played a small role in the, um, the Iranian, setting the Iranian dispute. Oh, yes. um, I don't think they've played much of a role in Syria because... Um, uh, actually, th the fact is that the EU hadn't been involved in that. This has been mm. an American-led coalition um, that's been um, uh, taking place in, in Syria. And the serious players are Russia and uh, Turkey Surely. and Iran and the people who are involved. Mm. Um, I mean, one of the sad things in terms of the United Kingdom is I think that we've allowed our defence capability to actually decline quite a bit not as badly as our European partners, but it, uh, our defence expenditure has come back quite a bit. Um, and I think that if we're going to play this serious role in the world, we've got to have the defence clout to be able to do it. Now, one of the problems with the European defence identity is the French are quite gung-ho about going to war, but the Germans are certainly not. Yes. And they're the two people who got the largest numbers of troops and so forth in Europe today. Gosh, I'm tempted to sidetrack. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you immediately bring up the defence issue. I've often felt that Britain could play more of a role internationally and that it's a great tragedy that so much of our defence budget, such a colossal proportion, goes on Trident, which is, I know it's um, nuclear weapons perhaps have saved, brought peace on Earth, but, but in the, at this point in time, we, do we, we, we could play a greater role if we weren't using mountains of money on, on, on a nuclear warhead, which we will never use. Or oh, you wouldn't agree with me there? <coughs> well, I am sidetracking. It's no, completely you're, you're, irrelevant. You're, you're, you're quite right to sidetrack. Um, yeah. and, and you're talking to the right person, because I've always been concerned as well about the cost mm -hmm. of the um, Trident. I've always been tempted. Um, I think I'm less tempted today than I was in the past um, to go for a nuclear deterrent. Uh, I think we've got to remain in the nuclear club. But of mm. course, you could do this with cruise missiles. And we do fire cruise missiles out of uh, nuclear-powered submarines today. Um, mm. The arguments against this is that the range of, of um, cruise missiles is much lower than that of uh, the Trident missiles. Um, and of course also it means that then your submarines have to operate in much shallower water where they could be detected. 
Mm. But um, there certainly is an argument, and um, uh, I've always been as appalled as you are um, by the cost of, um, mm. of the Trident system. And when I see the, the defense budget paying for this, and mm. I see our army being run down from mm. 120,000 yes. to 80,000, that's what really worries me, because yeah. our army is absolutely critical to um, being able to play a serious role in the world today. Well, absolutely, and it's, it's much needed. I, I, I agree with you entirely. Um, gosh, so foreign policy, well, what you're saying is foreign policy, British foreign policy will not be affected by leaving well, Europe. Well, uh, British foreign policy will depend on what role Britain decides it wants to play in the world. Mm. Um, if we continue to cut our defence budget, and there have been small increases, which have been very encouraging, that mm. we've seen just recently, um, then our influence will decline. If we spend more on defence and build up our armed forces and play a bigger role, there are endless conflicts we can be involved in. But you've got to bear in mind that the appetite of the British public to see mm. British soldiers killed um, in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, but when the results weren't very satisfactory at the end wow, of the yes. day in either uh, sphere of war, um, then uh, you've got a problem. Mm, no, I you've got to win your wars. Yes, <laughs> there was yes. no lack of enthusiasm <laughs> yes. for the British forces uh, uh, yes. and uh, us playing a role in the world after the Falklands, because that was a very decisive bit battle. But yes. uh, of course, we did lose quite a serious number of men in doing that. Yes, yes, you're, you're dead right. I mean, the, uh, the tragedy of Iraq, Afghanistan, even Libya, many of the British experiments lately have not been happy ones. They haven't. Um, maybe, but there's a, there's a whole ho other discussion there. There's uh, a long discussion. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, let's, let's leave that aside. We should, we should go on to our second topic. Our second topic for discussion is, uh, well, is migration. We, we touched on it already. Lord Hamilton, migration. Let's discuss this. Inward migration has always been controversial, largely due to the xenophobia and the resentment it generates. Nonetheless, mass migration has grown more commonplace in recent years. In refugee camps bordering Syria, some young men feel that they must either become radical insurgents or migrate to Europe if they wish to support their families. These ideas are now sometimes conflated with people suggesting that those migrating are themselves radical insurgents. Some countries in Europe have welcomed migrants with comparatively open arms. For example, Germany, which has pledged to accept half a million migrants per year. The UK also displays hostility to the latest wave of migrants. The United Kingdom claims that the burden of intra-European migration is enough to bear with many East Europeans moving towards Britain in recent years. Other European countries feel resentful towards the UK for its behavior in not taking what they regard as its fair share of migrants. Migration. I mean, it's a painful issue. It's one we've discussed before on this channel. It's, I say it's painful because I think in a, in a perfect world, we'd all, I, I'm a great lover of the poetry and prose of Khalil Gibran, who believed that we should all live in a world without frontiers where, you know, equal value is placed on everyone. And we don't build walls and keep people out. Um, and uh, in a sense, we've been living in a world without frontiers in recent European history because, because this sudden flush of migration from some very desperate people uh, trying to come to Europe. Um, what's your, this is a very hot potato, but what is your feeling on this issue? I talk to my libertarian friends in the Conservative Party and they say you should have no limits on immigration. Mm. Um, I don't really buy into that. I think that immigration is a numbers game. Um, certainly one of the reasons why the United Kingdom um, has less of a demographic problem with a, an aging population is that so many immigrants have already come to the mm. United Kingdom and they're younger and they breed and they work and they contribute. Mm. Um, and uh, Germany, of course, hasn't had that experience and has a very serious demographic problem, which may be one of the reasons, of course, mm. why Angela Merkel was heard to say that she was going to welcome 
900,000 yes. refugees to Germany. Mm. But I think she's found now that there's been an enormous reaction to that in Germany. Um, and many people in her own party think she was absolutely mad to have said that. Um, and she's now rowing back from it. But this is the problem. Um, we can all manage a number of refugees, but when it becomes too many, it overloads absolutely all the systems and infrastructure that you have in the country. Um, and there is, as far as I can see, absolutely no limit to the number of people who would like to come here because our economy is growing. We have a very tolerant society. Um, and if they could get here, people would come here. Um, and this is a very vexed problem because you then create this extremism um, mm -hmm. that you get, with, which you referred earlier to nationalistic parties. And, uh, you know, if Angela Merkel wanted to encourage the resurgence of a neo-Nazi party in Germany, a very good way to do that is to say that a million new refugees are going to come to Germany this year. Mm -hmm. No, that is disturbing. But it isn't... I mean, is it fair? You, you, you've, got, you've got a situation where, let's take somebody living in a, in a camp, a family living in a camp in, in Turkey, a refugee camp. Um, the international community in the shape of the United Nations has just cut aid to refugees, or at least their pocket money they get by half. Um, and um, so I think some, from $40 to $20 a month or something of that kind. Uh, so a young man living in that situation, seeing his mother and his sisters and his brothers in penury, has two choices. Either goes back to f Syria and fights for ISIS and draws a salary, and they do pay, or he becomes a migrant and tries, attempts to go to Europe in the fond hope of bringing his family after him. I mean, there's nothing else for these people to do, given their situation. And uh, from a humanitarian perspective, shouldn't we all be like Angela Merkel, don't you think? I mean... Well, I don't think we should if we're going to create enormous political problems in our own countries, which is what I think she's basically doing in Germany. Mm. I think this has got to be managed, and the numbers have got to be... She's got to take in very large hundreds of thousands of refugees, but she's got to bring mm. them in in quantities that are acceptable to the host nation. Mm. Um, and if you create a massive reaction in your own country... Um, then the whole thing is counterproductive and life becomes extremely unpleasant for these refugees who come in. But Britain is not pulling its own weight. I mean, it is well, not failing to man up to the, in terms of, certainly in terms of the current wave of refugees. Well, but, but the net immigration into the United Kingdom last year was 336,000 people. Mm. So we do have a very large number of refugees coming here. From uh, We have a lot of students who stay on after their courses and so forth and we're very getting a very large number of immigrants from within the EU as well because let's face it wages um, in uh, Romania are half what they are in the United Kingdom mm. so if I was a Romanian and I was bringing up my children I'd try and get them as well educated as I possibly could mm. and I'd then say go and work in England um, and send back money to us here surely and this is the problem that that if you've got these disparities of income between one part of the world and another, people are going to move. Mm. And communications are incredible now. There was a riot on a ferry moving from a Greek island to Athens because a very large number of people wanted to um, charge up their mobile telephones. Yes. And there were only a limited number of yes, charging points yes, on the yes, ship. Yes. Um, and these people are constantly talking to people mm. in the countries they're hoping to go to. Um, and because it, it makes much easier to move to a new country if you have your own compatriots there who can look after you and give you somewhere mm. to sleep and help you find a job. Well, that's only natural, but at the end of the day, um, this I mean, you're right about the intra-European intra migration from East Europe to, to Britain. Um, and, uh, of course, that harks back to our previous discussion on leaving the EU, and, and arguably that's one argument for that. But... Nonetheless, and you're right that net migration has increased vastly in Britain, but we are not pulling our weight with regard to the current crisis, the current crisis with, I mean, the, the current wave of refugees. I mean, that's how many of our European partners feel, isn't it? They do feel that we are... They do, and, and the Swedes and the Germans have taken, uh, you mm -hmm. know, as a percentage of their population, a much, much higher 
number of mm. these people. But you know, we talk about Syria. I mean, they're not uh, all from Syria. Um, no, 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 many um, from Afghanistan. Quite a lot from Afghanistan, and quite a lot from Kosovo, mm. sort of joining mm. in on the yes. general flows yes. and so forth, you know. So they're made up of a large number of different uh, areas. And mm. uh, I, I have no simple answer to all this at all. I, mean, I certainly can't say that. that but the problem is that the, the whole thing of numbers feeds on itself. And mm. once you take a very large number, then, of course, they're all in touch with people who haven't yet come and telling them, come on, life's absolutely wonderful here. Why didn't you come mm. and join me? Mm. Um, and I don't know what you do about that because mm. uh, this is going to become a bigger and bigger problem. Because the EU's reaction is to say that they'll set up this border force of 2,500 people um, which, considering the borders that they're actually defending is something like 30,000 miles, yes. um, whether 2,500 people are going to make a lot of difference, I don't know. But then, of course, they'll have to then, anybody they find trying to cross over, they'll have to take back to places like Turkey. And then the Turks will have to be persuaded and presumably given money to actually look after these people mm. and have them in enormous camps and so forth. Um, but uh, I can't see that this is necessarily going to be a very satisfactory situation. We haven't solved the problem of Libya yet. And a very no. large number of immigrants come from Libya into Italy and so forth. Um, are they going to take them back to Libya? Uh, because Libya hasn't even got a government at the moment. Mm -hmm. And are they in a position to take refugees and look after them there? I'm not sure they are. Well, they certainly aren't. Because many of those refugees are not Libyan, but have transited through from of the Horn of Africa, uh, from uh, Eritreans yes. and, and South Sudanese and so forth. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Um, poor people, but uh, what a desperate journey to make. And they're certainly not welcome in Libya. Um, but, uh, it, but Libya has fallen apart as a consequence, you could argue, of, of Western action, or at least Western inaction in terms of establishing a proper peace after the after the fall of Gaddafi. Mm. I mean, it's so often the case that we have this kind of mess. Um, yes, I think um, David Cameron was faced by a very big problem because mm. Gaddafi was on the verge of massacring a very large number of people in yes. the east of his country. Yes. Um, and it was quite difficult to stand by and do absolutely nothing. But yeah. certainly um, removing Gaddafi wasn't a sort of um, silver bullet in mm. terms of solving the problems for Libya, it created more problems than it probably it solved. Yes, absolutely. And migration being one of them. But um, there's a case in point. Uh, the, the British policy has changed dramatically on, on that, we, whereas we were standing aside from helping the migrants coming across the Mediterranean. Now we're assisting them, aren't we? We're well, we are, but I mean, we're stopping them drowning and we're delivering them to Italy. So we're not to doing anything to stop the flow coming in. You've mm. got to really reach a situation where you can take them back to where they've come from mm. and see that they're being safely looked after there. And I mm. think we're still a long way from achieving yes. that. So, in principle, you believe in a kind of, if not a fortress Europe, a fortress Britain, where we say enough is enough, we have to hold on now and stop the, the, the flow of migrants. No, I mean, we need um, a serious number of um, migrants, net immigration, into Britain every year. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a question of numbers. And once the numbers get too big, I mean, Cameron himself has said that uh, he thinks um, the tens of thousands is what the limit should be. And he's promised in the past um, that he would limit immigration mm. into the United Kingdom to 100,000 people a year. He's never achieved that during mm. the time he's been in power. Um, and he's not likely to, as far as no, I can see. And if we stay in the EU, it's going to be impossible to achieve that mm. because if the United Kingdom goes on growing at a much more robust uh, rate than Europe does, then, of course, people are going to come. You know, you've got youth unemployment in Spain today of 40%. Mm. Um, a, a young person in Spain would be mad not to come to Britain and find a job mm. rather than stay in Spain where it's almost impossible to find one. Mm. Yes, I, I appreciate that. So and and but some of this is of our own making, isn't it? The uh, um, the issue of the students overstaying. Uh, yeah. I mean, we we encourage that. We we say it's a great plus. Perhaps socially, it is a great plus for not just for ourselves, but for the societies of the world that there is that students study in different uh, cultures and and come across to us to study. But 
It is a problem that we have we have kind of created. The well, we have an immigration bill going through Parliament at the moment, mm -hmm. and that is of course going to put the onus on landlords um, mm. and indeed employers to check people's um, documentation and whether they have a right to stay um, before they either um, rent them out somewhere to live um, or give them a job. Mm. So there'll be some constraint, I think, on students who have overstayed because they're they, they won't have the right to actually be here. Um, but whether it'll make a big difference to the numbers, I have my doubts. So what we're saying is that, okay, so it shouldn't happen. Uh, migration on this scale should not happen. Whether people are asylum seekers, whether they're refugees, whether they're uh, economic migrants, the, the, the scale of migration shouldn't happen because it's more than we can cope with socially. But then we should be delivering something in the region, surely. I mean, and we are. I mean, we have a very big aid budget, and we're spending an awful lot of money on uh, refugees um, in Jordan and Turkey and uh, Lebanon. Mm. Um, so we're one of the biggest donors there. Um, so we, we are doing what we can to put money into the areas where the refugees are coming up. Um, but it's not a very satisfactory life. When you think of the Palestinian refugees, who have um, been refugees for decades now. Interesting. Um, I would it really hasn't been the solution for the problem for Palestinians. Um, and I hate to think of these people still being around in decades to come um, out of Syria. But maybe things will be sorted out in Syria and they'll be able to go back. We have got a large age budget. I will put in a little personal appeal to you as a parliamentarian. It's not very transparent. Um, no, I agree with that. Uh, I mean, we looked, we tried to look through um, DIVID, I think it's called, the Department uh, for international development, we tried to find out how aid money was being spent in Syria, or in regard to Syria. Um, very difficult to tell. Uh, it, it's it's it's. And you know why? I was there actually just the other day talking to some officials, and basically what they do is they initiate very little. Mm -hmm. They wait for um, things like the United Nations, UNICEF, to to come to them or indeed charities, with proposals. Mm. And they weigh up the proposal and say, yes, this is worth supporting or it's not. And then they give them the money. So obviously, UNICEF is going to claim the credit sure. for spending British money. But even so, <laughs> there's very, I mean, the, there, there isn't the kind of accounts you would anticipate that a, even a business would have. I, know. I, I mean, it's staggering. You can't see that this sum went to UNICEF and this sum no, went you to can't. It's, it's really very disturbing. And we're not getting credit for it in, in, in the no, area. No. But there, of course, they mentioned the problem of security concerns and well, so forth, that if yeah. there were Union Jacks all over yeah. certain areas, yeah. then, it, then they might attract terrorism. But, um, you know, th this is one of the problems. And yeah. I think um, Parliament, as select committees, have um, expressed a lot of concern, I think, about mm. the way our money is being spent. Yeah. And, of course, it is the only area of government expenditure which is mandated to yes. remain at 0.7% of the, of the mm -hmm. budget, mm -hmm. of, the, of GDP. Well, therefore, one wants to... So, therefore, it's increasing at a rate of 2.5% every year. <laughs> <But> yes, <laughs> and therefore, it should be being spent well, and we should be, it should be accountable. Okay. I, uh, sorry, I, our people... I couldn't, uh, you're, we're at one on that. <laughs> okay. uh, but, um, but having said which, uh, gosh, um, so have we really dealt with the issue? I guess we have. Uh, whether we've dealt with the issue of migration to the satisfaction of our listeners, I'm not sure. But uh, we do. I, I do feel a great grave sense of. I mean, we all, in a way, that in this world, love is more important. Is sorry, compassion is more important than love because compassion means if you're going to be compassionate, you have to take some kind of action. We can all say we love the whole world and then sit back fatly and. But compassion is more important than love, and, and, and you see this situation in the Middle East, and it really does pull at the heartstrings. But, but thank you. Uh, we've, we've touched on migration um, very substantially, and we move to our third subject, the, probably the hottest uh, potato, to use an American expression again, the hottest potato of the lot, the, the, the issue of extremism. Since the fall of fascism, Europeans had tended to regard extremism as confined to regions outside Europe. However, the 9-11 attacks in 2001, the 2004 Madrid train bombing and the 7-7 London bombings in 2005 changed that. 
now, today, after a decade of comparative calm, the 2015 Charlie Hebdo shootings and the recent ISIS attacks across Paris have brought the spread of extremism to Europe back into the spotlight. Does this reflect an increasing trend? What impacts will this have on the life of Europeans and European values? Should we begin to live in fear? What precautions can we take? And how can we fight against this threat? Meanwhile, there has also been an increase in extreme forms of nationalism in Europe. One example, sometimes quoted, is the rise of the United Kingdom Independence Party in the UK. But that is arguably unrelated to the rise of foreign extremism in Europe. By contrast, the resurgence in France of Marie Le Pen and the Front National can arguably have been accelerated by the recent attacks in France. Support for parties such as UKIP and the Front National has not been translated as yet into significant levels of representation, for such parties haven't garnered sufficient votes. Nonetheless, we are seeing a polarization in politics in Europe and greater sectarianism and radicalism in both the religious and political arenas. So, Lord Hamilton, extremism. I mean, where do we begin? Uh, we have extremism in Europe uh, in reaction to extremism in the, in the Middle East, you could say, or, or um, let's, let's talk about Muslim extremism. I, I prefer the phrase Muslim extremism to Islamic extremism. Because agree, Islam is the religion and Muslim is the, is the individual. Uh, but, but let's talk about it because it's, it is on everybody's lips and it's perhaps a starting point. Um, we've seen, we had, we, uh, we had the 9-11 the, the attacks in America um, which really brought it home what home is the whole issue of terrorism and extremism to the United States, but to the entire world. Then uh, we had the 2004, I believe it was, the, the, the attacks uh, in Madrid, the train bombings, uh, the 2005 or correct, well, anyway, thereabouts. We had the um, terrible 7-7 attacks in the United Kingdom with homegrown terrorists, it had to be said. Then we seem to have had a, I don't know, a period of uh, where things in, in the West have been more tranquil, almost a decade from 2005 to 2015, a decade in which, of course, there have been problems, but there has been no real major violence. Then, boom, uh, in 2015, uh, this chicken has come home to roost. We've had the, we had the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris. Again in Paris, uh, now this recent wave of violence. Um, I mean, um, where are we? I, is, have, have we failed somewhere along the line? Did, were we going right and now have gone wrong? Or what is happening? And yes, I think it's been a failure of the way that we've dealt with uh, Muslim immigration in the past. Um, I think there has been, we've allowed too many Muslim communities to be too self-contained. Um, are not integrated enough. Um, and I think that is being addressed to some degree now. Um, but I think this has been a problem. Um, and if you allow sort of what's known in the business as ghettoization, um, mm. I think you create more problems for yourself than you would otherwise do. But having said that, I mean, I think um, the whole business of integrating Americans and Australians, for instance, has been much better done than integrating immigrant communities into Britain. Um, and the Americans have their own problems on this yeah, front. So, yeah. you know, they, they haven't necessarily got the magic solution to all of this by any means at all. Um, and this is a very big difficulty. And I think we are very gravely threatened because we have experienced terrorism here before with the IRA. But as a general point, there were moments when the IRA killed tens of people in one go. Um, but it wasn't their objective to kill very, very large numbers of people. Mm. They wanted to actually kill members of the British military and mm. policemen and whatever, but it wasn't their objective to kill, uh, create mayhem 
among what I would call harmless bystanders. Um, and of course that is one of the objectives of mu Muslim extremism. Mm. And I'm not going to go into all the ideas one could have as to how to kill people in very large numbers, but there are many relatively easy ways of doing it. Um, and I think this is a problem that's only just started. I think it's going to get much worse before it gets better. Mm. It's interesting you say our, our integrationist policies have, well, we have failed in pursuing, in failing to pursue. Our, we have failed to pursue proper integrationist policies. But, uh, and you listed Australia, for example. Australia has its own problems. I mean, it does. Um, and there's quite a lot of racism in Australia. Uh, the, the, um, the situation, would you, I mean, I'm always tempted to blame Tony Blair for, for the, the multiculturalism that he brought in with the faith schools, which helped, I think, ghettoize our society. So uh, he becomes my sort of standard whipping boy. Um, I, and th I think multiculturalism predated Tony Blair. Well, yes. I think it's been but an established way of dealing with immigrant communities for a long time. And I think it has led to them developing a separate identity rather than feeling they were um, a, a priori British, which is the important thing that people should feel when they come to but this country. Do you believe that state schools should be faith schools? Do you think that, <coughs> I mean, that was a Blair initiative. Yes, it certainly was, yes. And, I mean, has that been counterproductive in terms of... I think it has, uh, uh, as a generalization. I think some of them are very good. Uh, mm. all a lot, lot of faith schools, because of different faiths, mm. have actually produced some very high quality education. But I think too many of them have not been supervised closely enough. Um, mm. And there's been too much preaching of extremism at them. And that has created one of the things that's created problems for us. But we can't just uh, um, narrow it down to schools. I mean, the internet is also an extremely important part of the whole business of radicalization mm. of, of young Muslims. Absolutely. And here, I mean, to be fair, Western, uh, there, there's a survey uh, done by King's College in London. Um, by They have a group that looks at, uh, I think, counter-extremism or whatever. Um, they have done a survey, and they looked at ISIS, Daesh foreign fighters. And foreign fighters, of course, are drawn from all over the world, from Chechnya to the United Kingdom to wherever. Um, but they looked at them, the, the preachers that they admired and followed on, on YouTube and on, on the internet. And there were four Britons, one Australian and one American. Uh, and those Britons, uh, I mean, uh, it's commonly known, it's just a, 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 not a question of libel, it's a, it's a fact. Anjum Chowdhury is one of the four. Um, very often they're not their views are, are such that um, that you you could say that they were they, you know they're not arrestable uh, what they're doing they're not bre breaching laws but but these are the people we are in the lead in 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 terms of the ideologues that these guys follow that the extremists follow it's our society that's producing them um, which says something and our society is producing. I mean, it's not just Jihadi John. It, our society is produced, I, I know originally he's a Kuwaiti, but he's nonetheless brought up in, in Britain. Um, and it's not just him. Our society has, here in the UK, has pro produced some of the toughest foreign fighters. In, in, uh, I mean, what's wrong with us? Uh, there's something going wrong. In our there's many things going wrong. And I think the problem is we have not instilled in these people a love of country, mm. um, which makes them feel that they're more British than they are uh, Muslims. And uh, that is very important. Well, it's, it's not, in a way, it's not one or the other, is it? It's, it's a question of a sense of belonging, I think. I mm. mean, people need a sense of... It's, if you feel you're not part of something, then you you go somewhere where you can feel you belong. Mm -hmm. It's it's true of all of us. We want to we want to be uh, with a peer group that we feel that we're appreciated. And we. Um, but I feel those families going and uh, mothers taking their children is probably much more to do with with the internet, yes. than rather than anything else. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, it's interesting. The other, thing, the other phenomena with regard to, I mean, I'm sure our listeners are aware of this, but the other phenomena with regard to people going from Britain 
is they come from specific areas. I mean, there, there's a group that have gone from Portsmouth, for instance, mm -hmm. where somebody goes and then their, their friends follow. And, you know, there is this, this cliqueiness about this, um, this, this extraordinary fever that has gripped sections of our society. And yet it's not uniquely British. You can't, I mean, I'm blaming Tony Blair. Uh, you, you can't blame him because uh, France faces the same problem. And Belgium, for yeah. some extraordinary reason, has a... Yes. Well, Belgium has a history of difficult race relations, doesn't it? it mm. uh, um, particularly in northern Belgium. It's seemingly an insurmountable problem. Uh, we do need to get into a situation where people feel they can belong to our societies in the West and don't feel somehow isolated from us, don't feel not a part of us. And it's a failure on our part that this, it has to be a failure on our part. It is it? a failure on our yeah. part. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Um, do you see, is there some quick fix? Have we got a way forward? Uh, I, think, I think rather late in the day we're now working on it and I think um, the whole concept of citizenship is moving on a bit and uh, that's helping. Um, but I think um, people are becoming much more aware of the risks mm. and mm. are doing something about it. But because you can't do an awful lot about the internet. You can do something about the mosques, you can do something about the schools and so forth, but uh, the internet of course is something which um, people have access to um, and uh, you know, without appalling intrusions on people's private lives, mm. I don't immediately see how you're going to be able to control what comes over the internet. Actually I do hope our listeners can help on this, I, I, I do feel there's a need for a counter-narrative. I mean, uh, so that those that feel passionately that extremism is not the way um, and that you know there is a better ideal that people should follow, that they should espouse that. I, I notice that many of the, uh, and you may not be aware of this, but much of the jihadi content that goes out in the in on the internet is is quite unfamiliar to us. They have jihadi poetry, you know, that comes out celebrating martyrdom and so on. It's a big thing. Poetry is a big thing in the Arab world. They even have. Um, X Factor style competition on Arab television as to who's the best poet, which is amazing to us. But we need the kind of counter narrative. I mean, those that feel, I mean, even our listeners that feel uh, strongly, they should be putting stuff out on the internet um, that says, come on, we, we need a narrative of, well, of, of uh, love and, and honest uh, compassion. I come back to these words again because. Because the jihadism, as we see it today, is based on hate of the other, which has to be, has to be wrong in any thinking person's book. It's just so. I think we need a reformation to within um, the Muslim world. I mm. think um, that actually in Christianity, you could argue that if you literally took some bits of the Old Testament, it could justify violence of one sort or another. Yes. Um, but of course, with the New Testament and with the Reformation. Um, we, we, we've actually become much more tolerant and we emphasize... We hope so, I'm not so <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But generally, I <laughs> yes. think uh, it, it, yes. it has worked. Yes. Um, but uh, this is one of the problems, I think, that if you're going to literally uh, mm. take the Quran as to what it says, um, then, then you can justify an awful lot of violence. And uh, mm. this is one of the problems. And this is why I rather admire what, what uh, President Sisi is doing in Egypt. Um, uh, oh, actually, yes. I'm trying to... Because let's face it, um, in a long time ago, when, when the Muslim religion first started, it was an incredibly tolerant, um, sort of wide-ranging religion that entertained Absolutely. different ideas and so forth. Algebra was invented and so mm. forth. Um, and, um, and it's sad, you know, that we can't go back to the origins of Islam, um, which was something quite different from what we see um, being expressed by these jihadis today. Yes, absolutely. And yet they oddly claim to be going back to the origins with their Salafism, but you're, you're quite right. Islam in its, in its genesis, in those heady days when Islam uh, was just coming, it was completely new in the world, was hugely tolerant. Of, of, uh, and it was, in, in the best sense of the world, extremely intellectual. Yes. In the, it was prepared to debate and yes. entertain other ideas and so forth. Yes. And there were a lot of very, very respectable academic institutions that were... Yeah. run under the auspices of uh, the Muslim religion. Gosh, yes. So we've touched on Muslim extremism, and it's, um, but what we haven't touched on, 
and in in the interest of fairness and parity or whatever we have to touch on is our own extremism. I, I mean, some of it is not generated by what's going on in terms of the Middle East. Uh, you, I, the rise of, I, would you call UKIP, the United King, Kingdom Independence Party, would you call that an extremist group? Or Well, I've watched, I, I, mean, I know people who um, have been involved in UKIP over the years. Um, they were originally um, very much people who were, the, the mm. core of them were, were in the Conservative Party. Um, and um, very much resented the fact that Europe had so much control over mm. politically what happened in the United Kingdom. And so therefore their concept of independence was separation from Europe and getting mm. our sovereignty back. Um, and then of course at a later stage they become much more involved in immigration um, for the simple reason that they found that takes them to other parts of the political spectrum, um, particularly um, w within areas traditionally been held by the Labour Party. Mm. So um, uh, the, 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 they've been given the extremist um, uh, label, but I think that's somewhat unfair. Um, and you could argue that um, immigration is something that's becoming much more acceptable to talk about now, that it is uh, such a very much bigger problem. And uh, I think it's healthy that we do talk about it. Mm. I think we've got to do that without being labelled racist, because mm. we don't think there should be unlimited numbers of people coming into the United Kingdom or any other country. So if the, fair enough, so if the UK Independence Party is not an extreme group, what is happening in France with the emergence of Marie Le Pen and her National Front, I mean, or Front National, I, uh, sh mm -hmm. I should say, to put it the right way around in French, um, is, uh, that is extremism, isn't it? That's, That's much more extreme. She's been, I think, working very, very hard to move away from the mm. sort of Holocaust denial of her father um, and so forth, and by all accounts, they've fallen out. Um, so she's been trying to make the, the National Front in France much more respectable politically. Um, but it was interesting that this didn't actually work when it came mm. to the final rounds of the, of the elections that we've seen recently in France, in that she was doing very well on the first round and then actually the French people united against her to vote her down on the second round. So mm. she didn't actually win any of the local authorities she was hoping to win um, in those elections. Yeah. And that was quite strange, really, because on the numbers she sh should have done. Yes. But yes. clearly the French people decided they didn't want her. It's there is a kind of threshold, isn't there, for any of these parties, UKIP, uh, Front National, or whatever. You before you get true political representation, you've got to get, you've got to get to a tipping point, haven't you? And they, mm. they were close, but not close enough. I mean, the UK Independence Party just had one MP, and he was a defector from, exactly. from the Conservative Party. And Farage couldn't even win the seat that he was taking yeah, as absolutely. leader, yes. which is extraordinary. Yes, and yeah. yet you look at their share of the vote; it was very substantial. And, uh, and you know, we've been hearing from Liberal Democrats for a long time how unfair our political system, our electoral system, yes. is. But actually, the effect of having the first-past-the-post system, which we have, mm. is it kept UKIP out of representation in the United Kingdom mm. Parliament. Mm. Yes, it does. And that's probably quite a good idea, I think. Probably. Uh, I mean, yes, it does actually mean that any extremist party finds it harder to get, mm. to get there. Um, yes, the, uh, the alternative is the, is the German approach, where you have, a, I think, a, a quota system. Where, where you have and then you have a threshold, don't yes, you? Yes, yes. Mm. But that's that ha comes with its own problems because people can feel disenfranchised, and they yes, in, in, in a way, our, yes, arguably our system is better. Um, I think that all of this is linked, though, to terrorist outrages. Um, yes, I, mean, I think if the terrorist outrages are limited in number and limited in the number of people they kill, um, then you won't have much traction for extremist parties mm. to get going. But if the reverse is true, if you have thousands of people being killed in one outrage, mm, um, mm. then you will find that the support for these extremist parties will build up. Yes, inevitable. And I'm afraid that's absolutely inevitable. Well, I hope it's not inevitable that thousands of people will be killed. No, 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 but, but, I, but I think the result of thousands of people being yeah, killed yes, is yes. that extremist parties will benefit. Yes, oh, I, I hope and pray. Mm. I hope and pray for a safer world. We all do, don't we? Um, and I, I, I do hope, I mean, this is where 
I, I believe integrated in education comes in. If we can integrate schools, then there will be less purchase for extremists in, the, in, in our society, in any society. So would you abolish religious schools altogether? Yeah, I mm. would. I, I, th There's I would. certainly an argument for doing that. Yes. I accept that. Mm. I, I think the cost, we, uh, there is a cost to it. Um, our own wonderful uh, Church of England schools and so on have been part of our heritage, but I think it's just gone too far. Um, and and uh, sadly, I think we have, I, I think secular education is best for Britain if we want a, a more integrated future where children, you know, are not ghettoized like their parents, not kept apart. Um, bless you, Lord Hamilton. Thank you very much for being our guest on ANN Television. It's been a real privilege and an honor to have you with us. And well, many thank you thanks. very much. It's been a very great pleasure to meet you. Too. Thank you. Thank you. So, where have we been with Lord Hamilton? I mean, Lord Hamilton is one of the greats of the British establishment. I don't know whether our viewers are aware, but the 1922 committee, which he has chaired for many years, uh, is a critical committee in regards to Tory governance and in regards to the way the Conservative Party is run in Britain. So, it is very much uh, a man of power that you've been listening to. This man has 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 shaped British policy over the years, has been behind the scenes, is a key figure in British political thought and in British political action. What have we learned from Lord Hamilton? I'm not sure what, we've, what we have to say about this. He's keen that Britain should leave the European Union and as he would have it, the, it's going to be a better world as far as the British are concerned anyway, if we do. Um, Perhaps he's right. Perhaps Britain should leave the European Union. I've always been much disturbed by the way we squander agricultural resources like fisheries in the EU, and, uh, but that's a uniquely parochial issue. Um, but Britain in Europe, its days may be numbered. We're going to have a vote. We may have well have a vote this year on whether Britain stays within Europe, and quite possibly Britain will leave. Consequences of that, well, the consequences, whether they're better or worse for Europe, are one issue, but it, perhaps Archie Hamilton is right, they may be better for Britain. As to the other grave issue, the issue of migration, this is really does pull at your heartstrings. I mean, what do you say? What can we do uh, to be a fairer world and yet allow migration? Many of these people are actual refugees that are striving to come into to Europe. I mean, people with desperate stories, people driven from war zones. They're not, I mean, some may be economic migrants, but significant proportion are people in, in term, having to face real human suffering. What do we do? Uh, Lord Hamilton would argue that migration has got out of hand. Perhaps he's right. Perhaps migration has got out of hand. Perhaps we do need to actually to go slow for a little while in order to build a more stable Europe, if Europe is going to be a place to which people can aspire to come. It's a tough issue, it's a sensitive issue. At the end of the day, I think we all have to believe in one world, a world without frontiers, a world in which people are valued equally, and that's what we should be striving for. And then the third issue, that of extremism. Well, it's, it's sad to see the increase in extremism, both in the Middle East and in the West. We have our own homegrown extremism in Britain and in Europe and it's, well, it's disturbing to say the least. How much this newfound parochialism and, and, and extreme politics is a product of the problems we've been having in the Middle East, I don't know. I, I, I think it's easy to blame the Middle East for a fault within our own society. It's a flaw within our own society. We've failed to integrate our own society and, uh, and Lord Hamilton quite rightly identifies that as at the heart of the problem. So where do we go? Um, 
where do you think we should go? What is your opinion on these critical issues? We would be grateful to hear from you at ANN Television. You can email us uh, and we will publish your emails on our blog. We have a blog for the English Hour on ANN Television. We really would be glad to hear what you have to say with regard to this discussion we've just had. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for being our guest on ANN Satellite Television.